Thanks, John. All right. Um, welcome. I am not Kirk Klingensmith. <laughs> I think Kirk probably feels really glad to be sitting in the audience tonight. So um, I just want to say thank you all for coming. I am Pam Walker, but I think looking at who's on Zoom and who's sitting here in the room, you guys all know that. Um, I just, it's, it's great to see so many people here. And if you've gotten our emails, you probably know that our emphasis this year for the club is to really focus on local fishing experiences, camaraderie and learning from one another. So being together in a room goes a long way to helping to further that. Thank you very much for being a part of this. Um, I know everybody sitting here and the people I've seen online know about how to follow us on Facebook. So if you're curious about what's coming up next with the club, you can always go to our Facebook page and then um, we'll move to the next slide. You probably also know about our website. Um, and if anybody has joined on Facebook and doesn't realize this, this is where you can subscribe to the club's email list. So if you wanna get information direct to your inbox, that's where you go. And you can also click to contact us by email if you wanna reach out. Um, but we are on a, a very tight schedule tonight. We've got a lot of great fishing experiences to share. So I'm not gonna talk very much and just say, go to Facebook, look in your email inboxes for information on what's coming next. There's one other thing I wanna mention, and that is that next month's program will be November 11th. It's an update on basically the state of the Shemung River, our, our home water. Uh, Liz Zielinski, who is the executive director of the Friends of the Shemung River will be joining us. And we will be presenting this at the First Congregational Church in Corning, which is the A-Frame Church on Pulteney Street, 171 West Pulteney. So please join us at 6.30 on November 11th as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Pam. I'm Bob. And I'm uh, agreed to host tonight's meeting. The, the content is really the three speakers you're going to hear in a minute. And they're very accomplished, so I won't take their time. But I, I did want to tell you what the format's going to be. Is each speaker is going to get 15 minutes. And they can either talk for the full 15 minutes, and then we go on to the next one. Or they can stop short of 15 minutes, and we take questions then. Now, at the end of 45 minutes, we'll take a few questions and I'll have some thank yous at the very end. But we will be done at 7.30 and we will all be gone or elsewhere at 8 because you have to pay an extra 100 bucks to stay and that is not authorized. So we'll be leaving on time. So uh, without further ado, thanks for coming. And uh, thank you, Jim Wall, for going first. All right, I'm Jim. I'm the secretary for the club. Been doing that for well, half a dozen years, maybe. Um, and I'm one of the weirder ones in that I don't fish around here. Try fish, but um, it just wasn't as fun as other things. So, um, <clears throat> as a way to get me into the proper retirement frame. Back in 2019, I'm the guy that said, you know what I'm going to do? Strap on 60 pounds. I'm going to go out west. And I'm going to hike a bunch of easy trails like that. And I'm going to go up to the lakes where there's all kinds of fish that you can't get here. Cutthroats, railing, goldens. Goldens, goldens, and goldens. You'll see some goldens. Anyway, so I said, I'm going to go for those things I can't catch around here. And then my knees and my hips and everything don't allow, then I'll fish around here. So anyway, that's what I do. I've been doing that every summer since 2019. Um, oh, no worries. <coughs> uh, so this is where I've been going every summer. I'll, I the fishing season out there is actually pretty compressed. Uh, trails don't open until the end of June. I go up you know, 9, 10, 11,000 feet. Trails don't open until the end of June, snow. And you got to be out of there by the second week of September or you'll get snow again. So um, these are where I've been going. Uh, each mountain range I've been going since 19 when I retired. And this year I did the Cloud Peak Wilderness in the Bighorn. Um, don't read an awful lot about it. 
Uh, you see a few YouTubes, but it doesn't get the publicity that, you know, the Yellowstones and the Madisons and Gallatins and all them places get, and the tobacco roots and all that. So anyway, I did the Cloud Peak Wilderness, the Big Horn Mountains. Uh, access points are Sheridan and Buffalo. Big. Got to kind of get a feel for it, but um, the question that that is often answered is, you know, so why why do you want to do alpine lakes? Well, um, why do you go to the alpine lakes? One is absolutely less pressured water. There's no question about that. Right? Just the uh, six, seven, eight, nine miles has to cut back on the people that you're going to see. In fact, um, your statement. Since I've been hiking since 19, I'll see people on the trail. Absolutely. I have never seen anybody fishing any of the lakes when I'm there. And I go for four, five, six, seven days at a time. So it is less pressure water. Absolutely. Yes, I see people on the trail, but when I'm at the lake and I'll be camping wherever there's trees, right? I, I camp on a hammock. Myself. Okay, why else? Because of the bears? Um, it could be people that don't want to be there. Could be. Um, um, you're free to jump in that 43 degree water anytime you want. Um, but why else? Get trout, take dry flies. Absolutely. Right? They, got, they got two and a half months to put the feed bag on. They just got to have the right one. It's called small. But okay, what else? I already told you this, right? You're not going to get these around here. Um, and of course, in the scene, right? I'm up there, I'm just like, okay. Um, the fishing isn't terribly technical. There's no Euro nymphing up there. There's none of that stuff. It's pretty much on a two fly system. I do two drives. The point fly is always, always, always going to be the missing link. You guys know that from a couple of years ago. And then the, the trailer, uh, I'll start with a blue. Uh, bloom style, a bloom style parachute amp. I put wings on it just to make the truck figure out what the hell it is. I don't care. Uh, and I'll fish that until I absolutely get so many refusals that, okay, I got to switch. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll stay with the link on top, but then I'll put a, usually start with a scud on the bottom. I do orange, it's supposed to be a dying scud and the whole bit, okay, whatever. Uh, and I tie it off on the eye so that any action up here instantly translates into some jigging action down here. I'll start with that, and only in a last resort will I, will I put on a, uh, you know, a midget. Um, that's the rig I You all you need, right? Okay, you have a couple of atoms with you. You have a couple of uh, uh, midget drives with you. Sure, because you got to. Maybe a caddis or two. You're just smart with your casts. No, now you're, you got to have at least a 12-foot leader, because they're, they're pretty spooky, but I use a border leader design. I don't, I don't need time knots out there. The three-piece section, you can read about Gary Borger's unileader design. I swear by it. I have no problems turning over two flies. Fine. Okay. Um, this was just a couple snap snapshots from this year. This year, I went only for gold. So I fished a whole bunch of different lakes that had nothing but gold this year. So uh, just a little snapshot of when you get to some of these lakes that have reproducing populations, you can get the whole span of maturity, right? This is like a four-year-old fish, 10-inch juvenile. And the, the, the par markings on that are just absolutely fabulous. And you can see it's a dry fly. Yeah, they take dry flies. Okay. And now same lake, same lake, different spot now, different spot. The same lake, 14-inch um, fish. Right now, this is your adolescent. It's like a maybe a six-year kind of fish. You can see the par markings are a lot less. Um, but uh, and then when you get to the eight and nine year old fish, you get these guys. Right? And these are just, uh, I, I, once, you, once you start bringing them in and you see all that gold color flashing, I used to. In what state are you in? This is Wyoming. Yeah. I've never heard of golden trout. Uh, the Sierra Nevadas is their original home. If you trace some of these genetics back, well, go, the genetics will go back to California Sierras. Are they? They got from California to Montana, has a couple lakes with them, and Wyoming by stocking back in the 50s. But these lakes are naturally reproducing. The lakes in the Wind River Range are naturally reproducing. Um, but 
their genetic origins go back to the Sierras. But I mean, just just you know, got some brook trout. Can you know, looks here on the white on the fin tips, and it's just like oh. So, well, this was kind of in the water, but I tried to keep it in the water. I could have to release. Anyway, so this year was all golden. Then it's just, it's just, it's worth the effort. And this year was 11 miles in from trailhead, uh, 3,500 foot elevation. Fish like this. Like days to make this cover. Yeah, I'm sore as hell when I get out. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure as I want to get out. Uh, and this year was particularly challenging trails. I told a story. <clears throat> Trail was so steep getting up. I woke up in the middle of the night the first night and I had a panic attack. And when you're climbing up, right? When you fall, you fall into the rock. That's fine. When you're climbing down, you can't fall because right? you just keep going. So I, I woke up in the middle of the night. Uh, but anyway, so there's Golden's in Montana or in, in Wyoming. It's the it's the Bighorn Mountains. You don't see a lot about them. Okay. <clears throat> um, and as most of you know, but those who are watching remotely, if you want a bit of a primer on how to do the backcountry stuff, um, four years ago in our program that you can get on YouTube, right? You can go back and search, and this was a uh, wasn't exactly two hours. Uh, an hour and a half program, and all the things you gotta prep for and plan for if you wanna if you wanna go backcountry. I mean, that would be good. And what else? Questions? So did you solo on this episode? I went with my best buddies, me, myself, and I. <laughs> well, yes, I, I mean, I I tried, I tried to entice people. What did you do for a car this year? <laughs> you remember that, don't you? <laughs> no. Um, this year, I rented in. I rented a pickup in Denver, and I I uh, uh, used the pickup for the entire five weeks. And what I had an interesting development this year was one of my credit cards, American Express, actually covers pickup trucks on gravel roads. Only credit card that will cover that from an insurance standpoint, everything else is paid road. But American Express added that benefit that they will cover not only unpaid road, I mean, not off-roading technically, but, but they also cover pickup trucks. And I need trucks, I keep all my gear with me from location to location. I have a big Tupperware with all my gear and food and everything, so I need a pickup truck. So I did not buy a vehicle this year, I rent it. Uh, that's, that's great info. Uh, it, uh, I, and it was American Express only. The other ones don't do that. They, they specifically exclude pickups. So you left, uh, you left the truck at the trailhead? And... Yep. Let the truck the trailhead go up for five, six, seven days, come back, um, restock, because all my food's in the Tupperware, big Tupperware bin, right? Which I, I, shipped the, I shipped the bin out in advance to a UPS store, like uh, just outside the airport in Denver. I shipped my, my big, huge thing to there. So then I... Get off the plane, get the truck, go to the UPS store, pick up my box with all my gear, and I'm on the road. So, sounds like you did. Yes, yes, all ball on the big horns, just just multiple trailheads. Yes, yes. And just drive from one to the other, you know, and do it all over again. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. Oh yeah, you guys want to know where I was going next year, didn't you? Next year is a. Two places. I'm going to do the Snowies, the Snowy Mountains, in uh, just on the Colorado-Wyoming border. They go up to 11,000, and there's Goldens in there too. Got to know where to go. There's only two lakes of gold. Um, and then my kid lives in Salt Lake, so we're going to, we're going to go up to uh, High Uintas for a week or two. Um, and I have a I have a hike identified in here where there's six lakes within two miles of camp, and I, within those lakes, six weeks. Six lakes, cutthroats, goldens, brooks, rainbows. All you, know, you pick your lake and you you know you slept. There's no there's no trail, right? You have to get you know, bushwhack. But that's where I'm going next year. Okay. And if anyone wanted to know what grayling look like in high mountain cutthroats look like. Okay, that's it. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I'm done. Well, I knew it would be good, but
Wow, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, so next up, we have Vince. Turn it over to him. Yes. That mouse right now, this right here. Just click on the, the left click to advance it. Okay. Well, so Jim did a great job talking about the Bighorn Ranch. I'm going to talk about fishing the Bighorn River. But I'm going to fish it the really easy way. Many, many miles from where Jim was, all this water ends up somewhere in a big river right along the highways. And that's where I'm going to go. <laughs> Except I had one little caveat where it wasn't quite so easy. Um, so, so this is the Wind River Range here. Uh, you'll see uh, this is Yellowstone here, Yellowstone Lake. You see the Madison coming out of there. Uh, this is uh, these are the uh, Grand Teton Range right here. So, the Bighorn River actually starts out as the Wind River, and then down here it changes to the Bighorn. I'm going to fish the two tail races: cold water, the, the Boise Reservoir, and up in Montana at Bighorn Lake. I'm fishing below the tail waters, the cold water, because I want the big fish. Um, that's what I'm targeting. Um, there's so much fish everywhere there, but I'm going to just target those two areas. So um, I did I did float trips this year and last year uh, that I'm going to focus on, but I have fished it along along the highway as well. So this is the Wind River Canyon, and this is below Boyston Dam. It's 12 miles of just the most beautiful canyon you've ever seen. The highway runs through it. It's gorgeous, absolutely stunning. And I've been through there many times, but I never fished in there. Well, it's, it's American, uh, Native American land. They only allow two boats a day there, and it takes years to get a reservation. You have to go with the Indian uh, outfitter and guide, and everyone I've talked to has caught really beautiful fish in there. But you just, you're not going to get a, a river float through there. Um, so the, the road, I'm standing on the road, but if I looked across, the road would be about this level. So you can fish that on foot with a, with a, with a pass, a $70 a day pass. Um, um, no, that's just a rock. rock. In there. So that's a pass from the reservation then? Yes, a okay. pass pass from the yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um there's another shot of it. The railroad's on this side. It's actually a little easier to get down from the railroad than where I am. But you should take a drive through there sometime. You go to Snirth Tobopolis, Wyoming. It's mm -hmm. just it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. So I always wanted to fish that. But the question is how do you get down in there from the road? You can do it. People have done it. So I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out where to get down in there and where to park. So I got brave, they got the $70 pass. And oh, by the way, it's also dense rattlesnake population. So I'm like fooled by myself. And I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. It's been a bucket list thing for many years. I'm gonna do it even if I die. So I found a place to park and I start walking down over the bank into here. I'm, I'm down there now, I live to tell about it. But I so said, I'm gonna sit down on my butt and I'm just gonna hold the vegetation and slide down. So I set my rod down, let go of it, and immediately goes to the bottom. I'm like, well, I've got to go down now and I got to bring my rod back. 
Down I go. I'm like, I am going to get back up there. Okay, I'm going to fish. At least I'll, I'll fish before I die. So I fished. It was 90 some degrees, super sunny. You see how sunny it is. Got a cloud in the sky, gorgeous water. I didn't catch anything, but you can only fish so far. You get boulders like this, you can't get around them. And you can only go so far in any direction. And when you're on the bank, you're climbing around boulders and you're looking for snakes and you're looking for where your foot's going to get caught. So I did it. I said, okay, now I got to get out of there. Where do I go up? Picked a spot. I literally went on my hands and knees. I got up there. I got to the top and I said, I want to look at where I came from. And I couldn't find the edge without getting out like this. And I found the edge. And so, oh my God, I came straight up that thing. And I just chastised myself for being so stupid by myself. Never do it again. Don't recommend anybody does it, but I live to tell about it. <laughs> so I had a guided trip the next day um, down, down below the canyon where it's um, not the uh, Native American land. Uh, but I did some fishing along the, you can fish, you can fish in the town of Thermopolis. There's about two miles of water there. Uh, and there's a few access points. I said, Bill Shakin said, he knows what I'm talking about. Um, so um, if you go, Let's figure it out here. Right, right, right here it comes out of the canyon. You're looking up into the canyon there, and now you're down along the road, there's an access point there called Wedding in the Waters. That's where the Wind River changes its name to the Bighorn River. And there's there's uh, Native American history behind all that. I can't explain it all. The, the name switches. Now I'm in the Bighorn River, and there's a beautiful access point there. Uh, I was elk hunting in Idaho one day, and we drove, stopped and drove by there. Caught some 20 inch fish and I've been going back ever since. Um, gorgeous spot to fish. Um, you can only go so far because unlike Montana, when you get to posted land, you, you can't be uh, on the water. They own the bottom of the water. Uh, you can't even anchor a boat. You can't get out and wade. So wherever, wherever there's access, this is limited access. Uh, otherwise you're, you're trespassing. So, uh, but if you get in Thermopolis, you, there's a couple of miles in town there. I've actually fished, walked out from the motel and fished. Um, so, in fact, I took that evening. I, I caught, I caught some rainbows. They're like 18 to 20 inches. Nice looking fish. So, um, the next day, I've got a guide, and I'm going to float. And so, I want to use streamers. And the guide says, "Well, you're going to catch a lot more fish on them." So I said, "I don't care. I want to." Okay, fish streamers. But we came to pods of rising fish. And every pod, we took one fish off it. I don't, I, I don't, I don't think it's so much I was good at just there's so many fish. And, and uh, we never saw another boat on this float, by the way. And I take a fish off a pod. Uh, I'm like a size 18, 20 inch parachute atoms or something. Go to the next pod, take another fish. 10 pods, 10 fish. They're all cookie cutter size, like 18, 19 inches. Then I said, then the pods, the pods went away, and so I'm going to streamer fish. So that's kind of what I'm after, something a little heavier while I'm fishing the tailwaters. That's the best fish I got that day. So this year I fished the Montana side, uh, same river. Um, so this river warm, warms up when you get far enough away from the dam. And then there's another dam in Montana, Yellowtail Dam, on the Bighorn. Um, uh, lake and there's awesome fishing there as well. So my buddy and I fished there this year and um, we wanted to fish streamers and the guy had let us for half a day because it was cloudy. And then the afternoon it was sunny, he says, you're not going to catch anything in streamers. Oh, we want to fish streamers. You're not going to catch anything. We didn't catch anything. We put nymphs on and we caught a lot of fish. I think in two days we probably caught 30 fish with half a dozen over 20 inches. Um, I'm going to show you the rest, the rest of the slides, really just photos of those fish. But we caught them on half of them, probably on a red San Juan worm, and the other half on a size 20 saw bug. They were, yeah, and it was just, it was, and there were no fish rising. Well, there were a little few fish rising. We saw one pot, I caught one fish, and that was it. But it was probably the best Montana fishing I've ever had uh, on any river out there. And I'll just show you photos from now on. It's really all I have. So 
Um, I talked to Joe Cambridge. By the way, Joe and Carol Cambridge were out there. And I, and I took a picture of them going by in the drift boat. They were with Barry Beck's hosting trip. Um, so I, they said, Joe said use the six weight. I had a five and a seven. So I used the seven for streamers and I had the five set up for dries. But when it came time to use nymphs, rather than just serve that five weight dry rod, I just put them on the seven weight. Um, so a six weight would be perfect. Um, I was actually in the backing on some fish. I'm surprised for that. These fish, and the, the water was cold. Now, when I got there the day before, it was 102 degrees. We fished and it was, it was in the 90s, the second day it was 85, second day, but the water was in the low 60s and uh, those fish were hungry and they were after. Mentioned earlier, it wasn't hopper fishing. We didn't see any hoppers. No, no hoppers. No. What, what month was that? Uh, September, first week of September. Now, it's usually trico time. It's big time trico time, but normally, but they weren't, tricos weren't there um, either. So um, that's about the smallest fish I caught um, <laughs> on the trip. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, there's a nice brown. Another brown. Another brown. So this was great. Um, so this whole herd came through. They're just free ranging out there. So you can see my, my boat is on the right with my buddy and the guide. And downstream, there's another boat. There were a lot of boats, but there's so much room that nobody really got in anybody's way. Unlike Wyoming, where we never saw a boat, there's a lot of people fishing this section of the, of the Bighorn River. Um, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Fort Smith has hardly anything. There's a Bighorn Lodge where uh, a lot of fishermen go. They buy packages, uh, the guy, the dinner, or the lodging, and it's just thousands of dollars. So I hired a guide independent of all these guys, paid a guide fee for the day, got a room for 260 bucks a night, and um, I did it that way and saved a lot of money. Had a good time. So, so when these cattle came across, guess what they did? San Juan Shuffle. Yeah, they stirred it up, which is illegal to do it yourself. They would never, from an ethic standpoint. But I couldn't help it that they were there. <laughs> I walked below. I walked below those cattle. I caught. Can you call them back and forth? Yeah, really. Yeah. So. Uh, that's, yeah, and then the largest fish I got, well, that's a 23 inch rainbow. But the last slide is the largest fish I got. We didn't measure it away, but the guy figured it was pounds and I was doing pound fish. So coloring on these fish is phenomenal um, in the Bighorn River in Montana. But the guy that actually does five day trips where he'll fish two days in Wyoming where I was, then they'll take a day off and they'll just, you know, go out and hang out and eat beers and then they'll do the Montana side. That would be a good trip to do. But you can do this on your own. You can just walk on along the road and park and have an easy way and uh, catch fish. Yeah. Yeah, your own boat. You could. You could, yeah. Now this takeout, this was about a 10 mile drift, eight or 10 mile drift. So it's, but um, yeah, I probably wouldn't do it with my rubber rubber pontoon, but um, yeah, you can. You can. And, and, in Montana, you can fish anywhere below the high water mark. So you don't have to be restricted to where it's public land. Are, are there places that rent? I, Kirk says yes. Yeah. yeah. Says yes. Yeah. You could. Yeah. Well, you can. <laughs> you can. There's but, a couple places where they can. I think it's day, day, day two, day three. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good night. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, you know, uh, I didn't take a close look at it. The streamer was, a, was purple. It had a purple tungsten bead, purple flash. The body was purple. It was rabbit strips, so I don't know what the body was. I don't think it would have mattered. There's so many fish in that river, and they're eager to, they're eager to eat. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, that's that's all I have. Bring it at home. John Lively.
Well, uh, my talk is going to be a little different. It's not a destination talk. It's uh, basically uh, highlights of my fishing year up till now and focused on mainly local areas. So maybe, maybe you'll learn about some place you don't know, although looking at this crowd, probably not. Um, but uh, you probably, most of you probably know, I've been keeping a fishing diary since I was 14 years old. And I have about, well, I have more than 20,000 fish logged in my Excel spreadsheet. So I, I went through 2024 and just looked at like, okay, this month I did this, the next month I did that and so on up till September. And, and I just picked out a few of the highlights, put some photos on it, and that's what I'm gonna run through tonight. Um, so let's, let's go to the next slide. January, I didn't fish. Sorry, but no. Uh, February, however, I managed to convince Bob to go with me to Erie, Pennsylvania. I guess we were getting cabin fever by by that time, sorry. Good. Um, I also, by that time, had you know, in the winter time, that's when we all buy new equipment. Right? We're like, can't not really fishing a lot, but we're like, you know, online and doing stuff. So I bought a new Diamondback six weight your nipping rod, and I was itching to try it out. So I, I convinced Bob to go with me. We went to Erie, and boy, was it tough. I mean, the water was like crystal clear, like drinking water. And I mean, there were fish. You could walk along and, you know, there's fish everywhere. They were not biting. Um, but we, we did manage, to, I, I managed to catch a couple of fish. And I'll be, I'm not going to pull any punches here. I know this is a fly fishing club, but I'm an, I consider myself an all tackle angler. And if the flies aren't getting it done, then I'm, I'm catching fish. So I, I managed to catch a few on Berkeley trout worms. They, uh, they're like these tiny little, they're not really rubber, they're synthetic material. And anyway, um, I, got a, I got a couple and I think it pissed Bob off a lot. Because, I caught nothing, I caught something. Because <laughs> he didn't have any, but we had fun. I, I, I mean, I, I think we had fun on that trip. And I, if I had more time, I would have put in some other photos. We, we, we had a great dinner at the uh, Italian sub place next to the restaurant, next to the hotel. And, and then we had leftover pizza for lunch the next day. That was, the only downside was I slipped on some ice and cracked my head. That was, just, that, was that trip, right? <laughs> I can't remember. I can't remember. I must have hit that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great, yeah, you're I'm glad I'm going with you. Yeah. I think it was right there where I can bring in. Anyway, so you know, even in, in the middle of winter, if you're really desperate, you can find somewhere to go and have some fun. I guess that's the point. Uh, then we moved into March. Who's, who's am I doing science? Yeah. Okay. So March is Generally considered preseason, but it really isn't because the DEC is very busy stocking streams in March and the season is open. So I did three trips and I'll be honest, because I've had a few beers, I do follow the stocking and I do try to go after the stocking has occurred. And I mean, three trips, I caught well over a hundred fish. And I look at it as, and I release them all, right? But I look at it as I'm doing a public service because those fish, if they're not educated, <laughs> those fish are going to be immediately caught and, and taken away. But if I catch them and release them, maybe they'll be a little more circumspect in, in what they eat <laughs> and last a little longer in the streams for my fly fishing friends. So I, I kind of look at this as my my public service to the five fishing community. Good man. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm happy to do it. But uh, I mean, it's 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 a ridiculous kind of fishing that makes your 
feel like a million bucks, like I'm the king of the world, I'm, I'm the master fisherman, every cast I'm catching a fish, you know, but it would be the same if you were fishing in a hatchery. I mean, so, <laughs> anyway. Um, so that's, that's March, you know, you're kind of, the weather's improving at times. Not always great, it's still kind of crappy a lot of, but you're kind of getting that, that itch and you're getting warmed up. Then in April, April this year was just like trout bonanza. Um, I went out 12 times according to my diary. Um, a lot of different places and for me, some new places, Kalaniski River I've never fished before. And we had a ball. Who, who was on that trip? You and Jensen and Bob. We had a we had a great time. And uh, before the flood, yeah, before the flood, we caught a bunch of fish. Oh man, it was really fun. And we went to the first fork of the Sinohaning, which is it's a little bit further away in PA. And uh, that was really fun. We all we all caught fish. It was a little tougher fishing. And of course, all the other streams that are a little closer. But the highlight was in on, on the day that we had that big solar eclipse, everybody was, you know, coming from miles away. My son came up from Philadelphia and he ended up he ended up, up by Henderson Harbor in some state park, like trying to find the perfect spot to see the eclipse. I was like, through that I'm going fishing. So <laughs> I went up to Takuga Inlet on eclipse day. And it's cloudy, you know, and it's overcast, and I'm I'm just fishing, caught a couple of fish, and then I'm looking at my wife like, oh, the eclipse is like, going to be like any time now, and I look up, and there's a hole in the cloud. I mean, literally, a hole in the cloud about that big, and the sun came out, and I saw the eclipse, and I was standing in in Cayuga Inlet in Newfield, and as soon as that eclipse started to happen, the fish just like. I caught three fish in 20 minutes. It was amazing. It was definitely a highlight. And that's one of the, those, that's a Cuga Inland uh, rainbow. Really, it was really special. It was really fun. So April was like, great. Um, that's how you should be fishing. Well, or, it, or during the eclipse. During eclipse. Yeah, yeah just go eclipse. during the eclipse, you'll be fine. All right. Yeah, no, but it was weird. It, I think the eclipse was like three, three, four o'clock, and when it when it got dark, I mean the peepers were starting to peep again. It was just like eight o'clock. Everything changed. Everything changed. Everybody, you know, all the all the critters were like, "Oh, it's it's like eight o'clock. I better like do my thing," and then it all switched back again. So, anyway, that's April. April was. Really good. Now switch to May. May is kind of a transition month for me. Still trout fishing going on. It gets a little tougher. We went to the Jenny, and as I recall, it was dry flies, and we had some good days. We had some tough days. Uh, we also had a little trip to the Delaware, and the Delaware has always been very dingy for me and almost like impossible. And I can't tell you how many years I've been there and never caught anything because those fish are tough. And thanks to the generosity of Chaz, who got us hooked up with some people who, I mean, absolutely know their stuff. They've been going there 30, 30 years. And they were willing to share their knowledge. Um, I managed to catch a couple of uh, wild Delaware Browns and you know like that. I mean, they're just beautiful fish, absolutely beautiful. They don't look anything like the stock, stock fish. So I was super pumped to uh, catch one. And the the proof of what I learned was uh, the next month I had a, I had to go to uh, pick up my wife at the airport in JFK and. On the way down, I stopped and fished the Delaware for a couple hours, and I caught a fish. I actually learned something. But at the same time, May is this also great because at the same in the same month, you can keep fishing for trout. Now you can also fish the Hmong, 
Kirk got me out. Kirk, everybody knows Kirk is like fanatical about my mouth and the shema. He got me out there. We, we had a blast. We caught some nice fish. Um, if you've never fished the stock brook trout ponds in the National Forest, they're a blast. And Park Station, I mean, crappies, I think, are an underrated fly rod fish. You could, you could throw a bear hook at a crappie and it would eat it. Uh, they spawn in the spring when the water gets right above 60 degrees. So if you hit it right, you can have 40, 50, 60 fish days with your fly rod. Great practice, um, a lot of fun. And this year I managed to do a little bit of everything. Don't tell my wife, okay? Um, June, now June, uh, things get a little tougher, you know, the, the creeks heat up, and so the trout fishing dies down. We did do a Jenny trip with the club, met some new people and uh, had great, had a great time. I think Bob uh, brought the food and cooked dogs, brats, and as I recall, I can't remember exactly, but we had a good time. And then uh, see the uh, the railing on that boat identifies it as Bob's boat. I think, right? So we, in in June in the Finger Lakes, it's spawning time. So all of the warm water fish, the smallmouth, largemouth, the crappy sunfish, and the rock bass, they all go into shallow water and spawn. And it is absolutely the best time to go up there with a fly rod. And you can just drift along the shore, and go in between the docks, and it's just like, it's a really good, really good action. This is just representative of a typical Tuca smallmouth. Tuca has a great population of smallmouth bass. Um, we had a great time. I, would, I didn't do enough of it. Um, I'd love to do it every day if I could, but I was busy. And then uh, I also had the opportunity to do something new in June. I had a family reunion in Maine, and I managed to sneak away for one day and go straight for fishing. And I didn't catch anything, but I did see stripers feeding on, on some bait fish in this estuary that I was fishing in. They were like, you know, 150 yards away over there, all this activity and so that's uh, yeah, no, I couldn't couldn't quite no, couldn't quite hit it. So, you know, I did some fun stuff. And then uh, July, July and August for me, this year we spent more time at the lake. Because my wife retired in January, and for the first time, we could spend more time at, at, at our place at the lake. And I fish Cuca Lake almost every day, five days a week probably. But in, after the 4th of July, there's a lot of boat traffic. The, the water gets really warm. And for whatever reason, the fish go down to 20 feet, between 20 and 30 feet. And the lake trout, of course, are all the way down, all the way down. I did a lot of fishing, but it wasn't fly fishing. We did have Bob up, and we um, we did a little bait fishing. And uh, he, this always happens. I take somebody up there, I show them how to do it, and then they catch really nice fish. <laughs> I, I went back to that spot like ten times trying to catch that fish. I got to tell you, I was pulling that fish in. God says, "Holy shit!" Holy crap! You can see the thing coming up. Uh, I mean, that, that's by far the biggest largemouth I've ever caught. Uh, bigger than any I've ever caught, and the biggest I've ever seen in Cuba Lake. It was, it was so much fun. And you know, in July, August, if you want to get a fix for um, fly fishing, I, I think we, I did go down to Rainbow Paradise once. Kirk, did you go with me, or somebody was? Yeah. Was up. Yeah, so you know, there's always there's always a place to go get a little trout fix if you, if you need it. All right, and then 
September is the last last month. Uh, I actually went to Alaska, and I, I had only been to Alaska once before, and it was for one day, and I caught some grayling, but I was on my way to somewhere else, so I didn't do a lot of fishing. This was my first fishing trip to Alaska, and I decided to go to the Kenai River DIY, DIY um, Bob Carlson kind of he goes there every year in July and they fill his freezer with sockeye. So he, had, he was, he helped me a lot with kind of logistics and things. I didn't want to go there and snag fish to fill my freezer, which is what, believe me, everybody does. Um, I wanted to go, you know, test my sport fishing ability, see what would happen. I went in, it was a Close to the first week in September. My, my logic was school's in session. It won't be that crowded. The, the sockeye will be mostly done and the coho should be coming in. That, that's how I came up with that, that time period. And it won't be snowing yet. And as it turns out, the coho didn't show up at hardly at all. So I did catch one, which is this one. There. Um, that was on a guided trip, and the guide knew exactly which back channel in the river to stop, and we threw some streamers, <laughs> and I managed to have one uh, follow and take, so that was that was really nice. But uh, there were plenty of pink salmon around, and I, I again, I'm an all-tackle angler. I had my fly rod. Um, I did catch valley and rainbows on fly rod. It was bead fishing. That's what the guides will hook you up with. Um, so you could ask, is that really fly fishing when you're just heaving the, <coughs> heaving the rig out with the indicator on it and letting it drift? Um, but they, they were readily eating the, the egg fly, the, the beads. Uh, but I also used uh, a jig. This is, uh, you can see up in these two pictures, well, that picture, these two and that picture over there, um, pink rabbit jig. So it's like, you know, just like a, uh, a zonker only on a jig head, pink. And I caught, I mean, the pink salmon, that's, that's that one. They were all, I mean, you could not float it by them and they wouldn't bite it. And then these are sockeye that were pretty close to dead. And even so, they would, they would bite it. <laughs> um, and uh, I also managed to catch a steelhead that's over here uh, on the Kasilov River, which is south of Soldatna, um, also on the same pink jig. So, and then, um, <clears throat> so I did a lot on my own. I caught caught the salmon on my own, the steelhead on my own. I, I, uh, I did two guided trips on the upper Kenai, which is where the uh, most of the sockeye spawn and where a, a lot of the guide, the fly fishing guides will guide. They do a seven mile stretch from Cooper Landing down to um, the Russian River. <clears throat> and they basically fish beads and we caught, we caught rainbows, we caught Dolly Varden, this is Dolly Varden here. And um, I'd actually did two floats there. And the second float, I asked the guy if I could use my center pin and expecting him to say, I do, you know, we, we do fly fishing only here. But his eyes lit up and he said, I just bought a center pin rod. Please use your center pin. And we, we set up the center pin exactly the same as the fly rod from the float down. And the other thing that was super lucky was I booked a seat on a shared float. Normally you pay um, $350 for a seat and they, they have three people on the boat. So you're, and that, the first day I went, it was like that. And the second time I went, and this is interesting, 
I went with a guy named Dave Lisi, who is from Corning. <laughs> and on the, on the side of his truck, he had lacrosse sticks and his, his like uh, Corning East cross number or whatever. Kind of weird. But uh, that second day, everybody else canceled because it was raining. So I had a private float with a guide who was really into learning about center pinning. And between his special bead, which had fingernail polish on it, every, you know, special, special egg, egg bead and center pin. I mean, we just had a ball. Great time. This is the, the biggest rainbow I caught that day. And the picture doesn't do it justice. It was just. You know, you can tell it's been eating eggs for months. A lot of fun. And then <clears throat> just to mix things up a little bit, also on my bucket list, I wanted to catch a grayling. And I asked the I asked one of the guys, I said, Well, you know, if I want this is the benefit of going on a guided trip, right? You can pick the guy's brain for other info. So apart from like where can I go wave fish and or some good access points. I said, where can I go to catch a grayling? And the guy goes, well, the best place is Fuller Lakes. You know, go up there, you'll we'll definitely catch something. So I took one day off from Kenai River and I hiked up 1400 foot elevation up from the road to, this is the second lake. There were two lakes up there and um, the lake was full of grayling. And uh, I, so I, I checked that box. I caught dozens and dozens of, you know, it was, it, every time, every fly you cast out there, there'd be fish trying to eat it. They didn't always feed, but. And that was, uh, that was kind of a change of pace. I didn't see any bears, but I saw lots of bear scat. And, Funny, Bob, Bob Carlson hooked me up with another guy who lives there who had Bob's bear spray from before. I was holding it for him and I stopped at midnight in Anchorage and picked up the bear spray and I had the bear spray with me. And I put it in my cargo pocket while I was hiking up fish. And I go to turn around and I saw all this bear scat, like half a dozen piles of bear scat on the trail going up to these lakes. I get to the top, I'm turning around, and my bear spray is gone. Now I have to walk all the way down through all that bear country with no bear spray. Well, it turns out I went no more than 100 yards. There were some guys setting up camp. And once I looked past their AR-15s with silencers, <coughs> um, which were laying against the log, uh, we got to chatting and, and they said, hey, is this your bear spray? <laughs> so they found my bear spray, they gave it back. They were up there bear hunting. And uh, so I, I was a little more comfortable. I walked out you know, walking back out. That day. And uh, so it was, you know, it was an interesting trip. The coho salmon that I was really, Hoping to catch a bunch of, didn't really show up, but I managed to catch a bunch of them. And uh, it's very interesting. John, what's that second fish now? The colorful one. Here, that's a sockeye that's um, on in full spawning color. Yeah. I'm calling time on you, buddy. Thank you, Jim. All right. I come in first. What's your name? Does anybody have a question online? You guys have been pretty good yep. about just peppering. The only kind of question is about the same. That's more of a common, but I agree. Amazing trip. Anything else from uh, cyberspace? No, nope, that was it. Okay. Well, thanks, for everybody, for being on time. Let's, let's thank all the presenters for their comments. I also want to be sure to thank our tech team. That's John Sanchuk, Matt Richard, and Kirk for your help. And our interim president, Pam, 
sort of bit miss all together. And we just have one more, which is we have a departing uh, a board member uh, with us tonight. Uh, that I'd like to recognize that's Mike Amazon. Let's bring him up right now. And he's, he was on the board when I arrived, so I don't actually know when he started, or me for sure. Lots of adventures. And we do have a small keepsake for you, which I encourage you to open because it's a, he has a request, but there's also a surprise. Oh, I have a request for my wife, and then she gave me a different response. Look at that, guys. So that's Beat the surprise. Your Beat your heart out. Put your brand new oh. This is sure. <laughs> well, it's a brand new thrift store. This is sure. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, let me guess. Bob, but only one guess. <laughs> Bob and I are uh, on the phone, and he asked I, asked I had any suggestions about uh, uh, keepsake. And uh, I thought about it for a little while, and I said, you know, if you've got one of those uh, celebration 20 years and McKenzie Cup glasses, I'd appreciate one or two. And yes, for two. No, you said you said <laughs> you said you and Pam had him, had a couple of don't go use them. That's right. And then he commented, as I recall, you had a, quite a few of those at the, at the event. Yeah, but you know now they're all lost, given away, busted, chipped by the dishwasher. Not the dishwashing machine. Dishwasher. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. All your years of service. Thanks. I don't need time at all. Yeah, I yeah. Don't, don't start. Start. yeah. Because I, I don't want to go over, but I'll give you two minutes. Two whole minutes. <laughs> First was introduced uh, to fishing when our family moved to uh, Myra, and I lived two blocks from Mount River. Uh, my across the street buddy, Billy, and I, with the quads of uh, dough, sent it with vanilla extract and go for carp. That lasts until mom figured out where vanilla extract was. <laughs> um, Skip uh, had a number of years. And my buddy Robert, who's a little bit taller than I am, uh, went perch fishing at the Pickle Lake. In the afternoon, we decided to get a burger and a brew. We were 18 at the time. That was the legal drinking age, which took some of the fun out of it. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've got some stories about Bill's uh, pond, but I don't want to relate them all. I just want to thank you. So I had a grandson that came with me up there at the Davis Lunch. Anyway, uh, back to. Uh, Purchase we decided to go to a place called uh, Switz Inn, Switzerland Inn, mm. a burger and a brew. And we're um, checking out the scenery, if you know. And <laughs> I, <laughs> what does that mean? So I, I see this uh, young lady over there. And I think that girl. You know who that girl is? I'd be asking. He only went to high school for four years. Ago. Really? Well, I introduced myself. Okay. I says, Hi, I'm Mike Emerson. She goes, I know who you are. And she gets this big smile on her face. I swear. I was sunk. That was, that was it. In Italy, they call it the lightning bolt, I think. And she goes, You know, the damn thing hit her so square, I thought her hair was going to fall. And she chased me for three years. Finally, I had to give in. We're married for 55 years. Congratulations. That's got to my own. Um, what else can I think of? Oh, I know. A couple of um, small stories about the year creek. I first joined the club. 
in the parking lot. I came over and he, he had hers. Chatted for a while. And before the conversation was done, we had actually been keep each other up. Um, not so long ago, fishing on that uh, sandbank that comes out of the Peter Creek there, because that way I can cast and I get caught in the tree on the creek. Anyways, fishing. Anyway, fishing along. And my fly gets stuck on something. Rat. Who's this thing? Yank it free out. Turns out. Well, there you go. Pretty soon, John comes up to me and says, How are you making out? He says, Well, I had a couple of strikes, but I couldn't seem to hook them. He goes, What are you using? I said, Out around and puts the fly in his hand. He says, I don't hook on this. <laughs> I said, I know. I thought I'd give the fish a sporting chance. <laughs> well, John smiles and shakes his head and says, good luck. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Mike. One more. One no, more. no, no, because we've we got a few minutes to chit-chat before we have to go, but we do have to be out here at eight. Okay, so one more about One more. Go ahead. One more. Cam comes walking up, and I said, Cam, how'd you do? Cam, I got a nice one this year. See? You tell me, you know, to teach you a lesson, I'm going to have to dunk you in the river. Just, oh, you have to catch me first. Man, that girl. Oh. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Oh, by the way, we're, this is new for us. So if you have feedback, please let us know. Uh, feel free to hang around, have another beer if you want. But really do have to clear your tab and be out of here by eight. So thanks, everybody. If you, want, if you do have an open tab, maybe going down the Thanks for coming.